Thank you, Ross, for the invite. It's a pleasure to be uh, went back here in Iowa State amongst uh, friends, long time colleagues, and, and mentors. So, uh, enjoying the day so far and looking forward to more. So, we're Rania Muslan and Haj Jalairi, and we're partners of Design Earth. And we want to think with you this afternoon of some of the concerns that uh, our practice has been engaged in over the last few years. Um, so, some of the questions that haunt many of the projects that we're dealing with. What's the agency of design in shaping the spaces of uh, territorial technological systems? And that beyond the city to reach things like resource geographies, which were very much the subject of Max's previous presentations. How do we think of the ocean and fisheries, for example, as subjects of uh, architectural design? And could we deploy something as a geographic lens to allow us to expand the scale of the urban beyond the city and to account for things as large as the earth, maybe larger? Um, and how is in that representation of political practice that decentralizes some of the concerns that politicians and policymakers try to think, narrow our spatial thinking into thinking about. So categories like the common interest or the common uh, energy crisis or energy needs, waste prices or waste needs, food security, as things that are labeled and come to haunt us without being actually deconstructed and thought of. So in all of those, the values that are embedded are a certain reproduction of the economic system. How can we, through design, actually bring forth some different values, other than the economic, other than positivist calculation and interior practices, into subjects of, of design? So we think through these questions in our teaching, in our writing, and in our speculative projects. And today we will reflect uh, on the theme of the conference, what is the urban, through our recently published Geographies of Trash. The book foregrounds the role of geographic representation, which by making visible as a first step, so a representation of project, and, then, and second, which by making formal as a speculative project, could counter some of the aesthetic and political abstractions um, of space, and that uh, under the different stars that, uh, that you can think of, in this particular case, the case of uh, trash as a lens. So let me start with a, with a first image, one that I'm borrowing from actually an old corporation. And we can use that to reflect on some of the capitalist organization of space, particularly as it informs the relation of the urban and the territory. So in 2008, Total, the oil and, gross, and gas company, conducted a corporate advertising campaign to articulate its position on the future of energy vis-a-vis -vis the rising specter of climate change. Their motto, communauté d'intérêt, or common interests, proposed to reconcile the objectives of economic growth, i.e. more energy production, more carbon out of the ground, with the environmental pressures to reduce carbon emissions and preserve wilderness. And that in the consensual image that you see, the object of the common. Visually, the campaign built on a strategy with two perfectly mirrored paths. Uh, this frame, for example, and this is one of a series of images, it features a polar prospection landform that reflects into an all iconic Manhattan skyline. It first divides nature and the city into two distinct and decentralized domains to later reunite them in rigid symmetry. The conversation seems to be over. That's the image of the urban that we are to embrace. Um, indeed, the mandate for clean urbanism, and we're maintaining clean here, thinking of trash, but you can think of clean in other respects as well. So the mandate for clean urbanism has rested on the city's capacity to divest itself of the environmental course of rapidly expanding urbanization, relegating responsibility for the inevitable byproducts, waste products, to political and geographic entities beyond city jurisdictions, what is referred to as an externality field. So because such spaces are um, zones beyond that of human occupation in its concentration form, as, as was mentioned, in, 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 as, as a moment of density, such sites and forms are often out of sight and out of mind entity for the public, as well as our respective uh, design professions, including that of uh, urban studies. So not much of urban analysis thinks of how geographies of trash could actually become um, tools for thinking uh, speculatively about urbanism. Um, so why does it matter whether geographies are imagined, represented or not. If we're thinking that in that first image that we shared, um, what is between the landform and the city remain out of conversation. It's abstracted in that thin line. Why is really the, why is it significant as an issue? So um, 
We think that when geography is made not to matter, the urban is confined to that administrative boundary of a city and the lineage of Manhattanisms. And that this design abstraction, it's important to think of it as an act of design in itself, is a powerful tool to contain, essentialize, and hence the politicize the geographic and the planning for different energy regimes. Such confinement of the urban does a few things. Three, it abstracts the materialities of these urban systems. So what are these different agricultural, uh, energy, trash systems that are involved? How big are they? What are their forms? How do they get deployed? Um, Second, it leaves out the geographic associations that the deployment of these systems had in these geographies. So once uh, an energy pipeline is deployed, once a trash system is implemented in a region, how does this reconfigure the landscape in which it's projected? And third, it doesn't attend to the politics of consensus or dissensus on how to organize the world and distribute force and value. We are left without a, a deep political understanding of how that geography is embedded in political dynamics. So when geography is reduced to that thin line, the city is detached from the three things, from the technological, from the geographic, and from the political attributes of the urban process. Um, so if urbanism has served, amongst other disciplines, to abstract the social and spatial relations of these technological infrastructure, could do the geographic as a paradigm, as a representational practice, and as an aesthetic project, allow to expand the scale of the urban to account for the earth? And bring, into the, in, and bring it into the domain of both disciplinary and public controversies. And we'll elaborate further on that. So this is what Design Earth, the research speculative practice that uh, Yadni and I have, uh, are, are, are engaged in. This is some of the questions that we're thinking of. We're essentially thinking of the relationships between geographies and design, and particularly the geographies of technological systems to open up aesthetic and political concerns for architecture and urbanism. It is both a representation and a speculative project, as uh, you'll see shortly, which by making visible and formal, counters some of these abstractions in space. Um, of course, a noted uh, tribute to where some of that conversation has started. We met uh, as part of the founding editorial team of New Geographies, uh, and some of our colleagues are in the room. Uh, Antonio is around, uh, and Nikos is around. So some of the embedded themes have been part of our earlier conversations of thinking of these larger contexts. And uh, so in terms of scale, this is where the scales of the earth issue that has the edited, but also thinking about other issues that have been traditionally confined to engineering, ecology, or regional planning. And this is the issue on landscapes of energy, for example, that I edited. So could the geographic play that synthesis role that is either divided into different fields, and what can we think of the formal repertoire in that case. So let me start with a short story or a short project, and then we'll elaborate the longer uh, project. This one was a competition um, in which we thought of the brief as a way to introduce some of our approach to the issue of trash. Uh, mind you that some of these issues have been brought up by environmentalist constituencies in the 1960s, which invited us to think and realize that there is not really an outside in which the unwanted consequences of our collective actions could be allowed to linger and disappear from view. That there is not really a zone of reality in which we could casually rid ourselves of the consequences of human, political, industrial, and economic life. So how can we reclaim these forms, technologies, and economics of trash systems in the production of urbanism? This project, Belly of the Mountain, incorporates banished externalities into the city of Rio de Janeiro at the site of its most iconic landform. It reacts to the urban condition of the city now, where the growth of infrastructures, be they energy facilities, industrial zones, or landfills, are butting against the geographical features of the Corcovado mountain and the hills that have physically and symbolically marked the landscape. So the response to this pattern of urbanization has been to relocate these infrastructure programs beyond the city while preserving the neighboring Forest National Park that hosts the colossal sculpture of Christ the Redeemer. This approach only perpetuates that divide um, surrounding the city into one which is a land too pure to be used and another a land so defiled that with waste that it must be uh, extradited. So it's an approach which very much resonates with the image that, uh, that we started the conversation with. Uh, but the mountain actually embodies this primal urban desire to have the cake and eat it too. So it responds to that organizational diagram 
by collapsing the space of the nature preserves and that of the toxic zone. It is simultaneously a site of both sanctification and defilement. It preserves the former green shell of the iconic Corcovado, all while housing a series of urban externalities in excavated mountain grottos. It takes on within its valley the cemeteries, the water purification plants, and other facilities, processing gray and dead matter, and capitalizing on some of the processes of uh, fertilizing, uh, um, of, of producing fertilizers, purifying air, etc. So somehow, by assembling a series of aberrations or unwanted, uh, unwanted matter, it draws us into the shadowy nature of the earth and simultaneously of our humanity in that. Um, so how expansive is, is that scale of uh, uh, urban management uh, in the age of the environment, if we are to call it so? Um, two quick episodes. One, uh, 1987, this barge, Mobro 4000, and famously holds 3,000 tons of trash from New York, and over a period of two months across five states and three countries, which all banned the barge from unloading it. Basically, the, the desire was where can we upload it with the least cost of resistance. So it went all the way to Belize until it was finally incinerated where it originated, in New York. At that time, uh, the former mayor of New York, Ed Koch, had a few suggestions on the fate of garbage. He said, burn it, bury it, recycle it, or send it on a Caribbean cruise, which is uh, basically how this barge spent its spring break. Um, it did spark a nationwide uh, interest in the question of a garbage crisis. And the term, the, both terms being together in quotation is important because they get associated in a very solid way. Um, asking us to, uh, to think about how do we deal with the uh, a, a rate of production of waste which surpasses our capacity to dispose of it. The response being continuously to remove it further from the site, burn it into thin air, dip it in the ground, or again, send it uh, somewhere warmer. Another scale of thinking that is uh, is really that of the planet here or beyond. Uh, an earlier episode, August 1966, Life magazine published Planet Earth by Dawn's Early Light, a photo essay from the Gemini 10 shuttle flight. Captured the Earth from the most remote perspective to date, but the final photograph of that series showed a single trash bag floating in space. That bag which contained the different objects that NASA had intended to leave behind before the mission's return flight to Earth. At over a million feet over above the planet's surface, that plastic bag and its contents seem categorically unrelated to trash on Earth, more of a time capsule than, than litter, this, ma this desired matter out of place. Yet, as the short essay that closed the article alerted readers to the growing clutter of space trash, it argued that more than 1,200 large objects at that point were lingering in orbit and that someday could pose a serious traffic problem in space. So not even the infinite volume of uh, outer space, as we imagine, was exempt from the perils of trash. Um, so, and the editors did not leave out. They did mention that it was a similar concern in our cities uh, that were being clogged with animal waste and garbage that could eventually come and haunt us with extraterrestrial street cleaners. So, um, I mean, somehow we're tempted to examine a retroactive history of uh, the environmental movement, which would adapt which would adopt uh, this image rather than that of the iconic Lombardo image as its foundational image, to inherently um, imagine trash as always within our worldview and outside. But that's, uh, that's something we can talk about maybe later. Um, but as both episodes bring us to think that the, 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 the where trash originates, how it moves, and finally where it goes to are all questions of the geographic. So something uh, to think about. And this is basically, uh, some of these issues that were haunting this project. Um, it's a response to a question after a few observations, whereby if the externalization of trash had also placed it outside of the design environmental agency, can we, through the geographic, re-inscribe these technological systems within our disciplinary practices and imagine these? So think about it as a, as a, as a, as an, as a research question, in the, in the sense that this was uh, open-ended before we actually came together to think through the project. They're meant to be thought processes in themselves, along, this, along with the project. To give you a quick sense of how we went about it methodologically, 
the book had a four-part structure, and this is somehow the structure of the research as well. One is to construct that theoretical framework of how is trash embedded in the barrier, the mass burning, abandonment, recycling. It's basically, how does it deal with uh, economic excess? Uh, and that's through a, a, a spatial and a historical lens. Second, it charted relations of trash and space in Michigan, which was the site of our investigation across different scales. So it's from that of the block, to the township, to the city, to the state, and to engage some continental flows that were regulated as well by these processes. And third, um, a series of five speculations on alternative strategies through which we could start to reclaim trash as matter in place. And through these four, so through these three sections, the projects come together in the fourth section of the book, uh, which is to assemble and which thinks the space of trash brings, it, which brings it into public visibility through an actual installation um, in space. So uh, this research was developed within the context of research on the city at the University of Michigan Government College, and it was thought of as, a, as an initiative to stimulate uh, thought and research on the contemporary city had Detroit clearly as the case study for the five teams that were awarded grants for the first yearly cycle. And part of our pitch to have to think something which was not clearly bound to Detroit was to say, uh, diagrammatically, if you capture all 71 Michigan landfills, just in terms of area together, it would kind of make up for city-sized issues. So their areas would be nearly the size of a township, similar in scale to that of an Arthur. Um, it's kind of a tongue in cheek uh, diagram, but it kind of says, they're partially dispersed, and that's part of the reason why we don't conceive of them necessarily as such. Um, so the second, the, 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 the aspect of representation looked at the different material, economic, and political geographies of trash in Michigan. So the dimensions, the forms, processes, actors, boundaries, sites, scales. Um, and more literally, the methodology was quite simple. It followed the trash bag. So from the domestic domain to that of continental flows both within the US and across uh, uh, between uh, Canada and the US. So that's, that was the rule of the game. Um, and in the process, um, we narrowed it down to particularly municipal solid waste, it's organized into different categories, and this starts to give it a specificity, which is no longer that abstraction that trash refers to, but it becomes more specifically municipal solid waste in this case. So it's waste from households, uh, bulky waste from commerce and trade, uh, office buildings. This is not industrial waste. We're not we're not operating in that domain for this for this project, um, and that has its own specific technology. So the trash bin, the landfill, the transfer station, the county regulation, the state tipping fees are part of how this industry is operating its regulator. Uh, I probably won't uh, go through the details of the, of the incinerator and the landfill in Michigan, but I just say that it, they're both fascinating stories. Detroit had the most expensive incinerator in the country, one which got it seriously in debt, its largest financial transaction actually, mm -hmm. uh, and the other which is the scaling up of the of this of the landfills. So in the somewhere between the 1975 and the 1990. 70% of America's landfills closed down because of stricter environmental regulations, which meant higher costs. So we, something was born, the mega thing was born as a, as a phenomenon. Um, and of course, they're, they're more expensive to run and operate as they're smaller landfills, so we can imagine the economic implications, as well as the spatial implications that that has. Um, the immediate Detroit, Detroit metro area has 14 active um, <coughs> landfills that accept weights. And if you notice, most of them are on the outside ring of the township. Uh, they, that, that, that territorial structure also happens to be where the major roads are. So that's, that's part of the reason. But they're also far from any center of that township, any town proper. They're kind of the furthest they can be in that, in that unit of spatial organization. So in that sense, trash is not really out of space. It's very much territorially embedded. And you can see it at different scales, always getting close to that to that line, to that boundary line, it's pushing against it. Um, and let's let's speak to the five part. So I will jump in just here, actually, to flip to present uh, the project that we have developed in relation to this research. So the project section here explores uh, designs agency to uh, prompt disciplinary and public debates on geographies of trash systems. 
So this section operationalizes the mappings and proposes five site-specific yet uh, typological architectural strategies which are working at different scales and addressing different issues. Uh, they, they reintegrate waste management into design practices and this is our hope for this, uh, for this section. The specificity of the, the site is uh, extremely important and uh, so I, I want to uh, maybe present the project one by one. Uh, so, cap, collect, contain, preserve, and form. Uh, so, cap, it's th this is the first exercise that uh, actually we, we have uh, we have done. Uh, cap formalizes the metrics of landfilling operations into a geographic monument. Urban peripheries along the major highway arteries uh, are. Uh, the sites uh, where trash is buried uh, and buried under a swath of green carpet, hidden or naturalized at the periphery of cities as Rania just mentioned. The 1976 Resource Conservation and Recovery Act uh, required states to develop comprehensive plans to prohibit the open dumping of solid waste and set criteria for landfills. And this is the, was the beginning of our proposal. Uh, so CAP here, which is the first project and first proposal, gives a monumental form to the component of a landfill architecture, both as a site and as a project. Uh, so the project rationalizes the process of landfilling, cell construction, material stacking, and track circulation. Uh, the, the, the outcome is uh, a ziggurat of trash cells. And the project actually culminates uh, in its site uh, in uh, Detroit, the 20 mile automotive Mount Road corridor. So the project serves as a monument to decentralizing and wasteful forces of Detroit's urbanization. By, by giving uh, visible and monumentalizing a landfill, uh, and here you, you can see uh, on the foreground a weighing station, uh, the project reclaims the infrastructure of waste as an object of civic pride and a disciplinary imaginary. This is Collect, this is the second project. Uh, this project uh, localizes the surplus value of recycling out of the monopoly of vertically integrated corporations uh, within, uh, to place it within the scale of the neighborhood. The revenue of recycling waste operation is gained from discerning objects that hold values from those that do not. Various uh, monopolizing entities in the waste management system have uh, have had the possibility to extract some time value twice. Uh, once uh, when they collected uh, from the throwers, and the second time when they sell it to uh, manufacturers. So, can we imagine a process that reclaims the economic value of recycling for residents of the city, particularly at the moment where Detroit is. Uh, losing population, but also economic activities and urban services. So can we mobilize the economic value of recycling and the social capital that is connected to it uh, into the space, into the inner space of the shrinking city? Collect here uh, localizes the surplus value of recycling uh, at the urban neighborhood unit. So the project converts the Russell Woods, and this is another second neighborhood in Detroit, uh, park into the ground for the collection, sorting, and redistribution of solid waste. Transforming the neighborhood waste economy into the ground of a collective project, away from the uh, scavenger consumer binary. The third project contains here integrate waste management technological uh, systems into forms of uh, building types, and here uh, the inside of the 
of the urban block. Trash is hauled over long distances, usually from affluent areas to less privileged ones to, dis to displace the associated social costs. What would happen if we would limit the transit of uh, garbage so that each community would manage the waste he would produce? What kind of architecture would emerge if waste could not simply be carried away? Can waste, uh, can waste management be rethought uh, as a productive typology connected to the urban block? Contains here internalizes composting and burning within the courtyard of the perimeter building type. Detroit shrinking economy has emptied out much of this fabric and much of, this, of, of, of these typologies. The project here deploys trash management as a, a redevelopment strategy for the pole town here, neighborhood in Detroit, which historically has been very active and has been pursuing very similar activities. Contain allows pole town to rebuild itself from the waste it manages. Byproduct of low-tech low composting constitute the soft surfaces of communal spaces within the park, such as lawns, fields, gardens. The bottom patch of high-tech burning is used as aggregates in the construction of hard surfaces for the perimeter housing block, such as pavements or concrete blocks. Eventually, the project eliminates the distinction between waste and resources for the enclave city. Since the 1980s, landfills have been uh, constructed with uh, plastic liners uh, to, to sort of ensure the permeability of, of the cells. So this is a synthetic membrane uh, that is uh, the same that is used for the trash bag and that is supposed to prevent the content from leaking its fetid liquids into lakes, streams, and groundwater. The life of the membrane, unfortunately, extends well beyond the time period for which states are required to maintain and monitor landfills after closure. Can we imagine alternative landfill ecologies other than those uh, with indeterminate lifespan. Pre preserve here curates ecolo ecology by engineering the operation and life cycle of a landfill. In a twist on the image and politics of nature, here the project transformed a, a golf course within the Indian uh, Spring Nature Preserve at the extent of Detroit outer city into a renewable landfill. Within the site, the liner is replaced by decomposition strategies and remediation processes that allow trash to become part of the preserved ecology. Such places liability on industrial and chemical operations before the toxicity of their wastes arrives to the landfill. Preserve attracts bears and deers, maybe, and a multitude of species that, that can feed off such waste. A 1950 study found that most, of, most cities in Metro Detroit region employed uh, hogs and uh, pigs to dispose uh, of the garbage produced by the city. Such trash was subsequently compiled with soil to produce a fertile duff. The project here shifts the object of design from post-termination redevelopment strategy uh, to the operating of the landfill itself as a political ecological issue. So, along with the research publication, um, a 6 by 6 by 6 feet cube installation collects these five projects into an object and space. 
They each represent the territory of a Michigan township. That's what the grid does on each side of the cube. It's half line image of a project site, which is quite critical, as I mentioned. It's printed on acrylic. And then an aluminum etching of the project specific site with a yellow resin cast model of the proposed project. So that's kind of the materiality of, uh, of assembly, how they come together. Um, so the, that physical assembly is also an assembly of the public around that conversation, which aspires to shift the debate from uh, their focus on what Bruno Latour calls matters of fact, that is when garbage and crisis gets coupled together within uh, a quotation. So away from positive solutions to these uh, crises um, that insist that the perpetual solution is to keep them out of sight eventually, um, and rather to posit these questions as matters of concern in which uh, we uh, think of a different nature of an evidence and how do we go about operating in these sites. So we, we draw attention to that possibility of a matter of concern, to an, to an argument that accepts the fact that urbanization does create issue that we must address and that we're always brought up by divisive matters of concern to some form of a provisional makeshift disagreement. So we will not completely agree and this will not be a um, they live happily forever after solution, but that's the only way to keep the conversation on the urban technology and politics um, going. Um, how are we doing with time? Okay, so, um, and, and we can think about that uh, later on. Um, in relation to, uh, to how we move away from urban managerialism to other forms of, of, uh, of urban practice. Um, and that's also uh, what we're looking for in that geographic sensibility. So we move to think about things as, as scale and territory through actually thinking of the territorial infrastructure. And most of all, we would like to think about how we make a difference and intervene within power and its representation in ways that make a difference. So it's not purely a representational practice, but it seeks to uh, um, uh, redistribute power and space uh, across actors. Um, uh, just to, to, to give take you back to that image of the Apollo with the trash bag suspended in space and the, the, the warning then that we might be dealing with uh, outer uh, space trash as one issue one day. So that's a recent project that uh, uh, we were awarded first prize with for the Jacques Rougerie Foundation in which we, we um, were thinking actually of how the issue of space trash and how uh, that satellite that is launched around the Earth has come to pose according to NASA risk to that continued reliable use of outer space and to the safety of people and persons on Earth. So these are the satellites from the 40 countries that are placed in that geostationary orbit around the Earth, that ultimate point where you can be there um, in, with the force of gravity. So currently the process is, is cleaned up that, that orbit by compacting, by moving uh, the waste into other orbits or by pulverizing them. And we're thinking of a possible strategy in which uh, we can actually collect that waste with a big robotic arm and actually uh, uh, through that uh, build a new satellite planet around the Earth. Um, that compacted mass that grows organically into planet Laika, the Earth's second moon. Uh, it's a project that does articulate the design Earth will to, uh, to relate the internal, the external and the area layers of the Earth or the project of geology, geography and the cosmos together. Um, and it does explore also, to go back to that question of humanity, what it means for us cyborgs to be embedded in these high-tech space junk words. Thank you. Good. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, we have, a, again, a few minutes to take a couple questions. So, um, yeah, I'm um, very interested in the topic of waste. I wrote a book uh, 10 Sorry. years ago um, that's called Designing America's Waste Landscapes. My name is Miriam. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> of course, this is a very important reference in that conversation. Right. Uh, and I was, um, I was really reminded of it because, you know, it, it was a time, it was, it was around 19, late 90s and the beginning of 2000 that, uh, that a lot of thinking went 
for me, from an artistic perspective, right, uh, went into sort of the notion of how can you turn on its head uh, the idea of, you know, outside, the idea of what is, you know, waste uh, into resource. Um, and, you know, uh, you're probably familiar with all these exhibitions and competitions at the time. Uh, what, what I was curious about, I mean, I really appreciate your website and I need to go and really explore it. Um, and I found your, uh, the sort of the way that you process the information and the mapping to be very, um, sort, of, sort of a new way of thinking about it. Okay. However, uh, when it came down to providing solutions, uh, it seems to me that we have already been there. That is, I'm, I'm wondering if you know new way, new technologies that are actually opening, <laughs> opening, you know, uh, new ways of thinking about how to deal with it. And I'm not quite sure I'm there. Maybe I need to get a little bit more in-depth in it. But the notion I mean, the notion of situated technology, the notion of understanding, you know, where the piece, first of all, what is garbage, but also uh, how we collect new information about it and mapping it, and how it can, it can provide us new ways of thinking. Uh, so anyway, I'm just, this is all sort of like going in my head right now, so I don't know if I have a question. <laughs> I mean, you rightly point to a, a very rich, uh, I would call it avant-garde legacy in thinking the relations of waste and space. And similarly to how we draw on uh, visionary thinking in different branches of urbanism up to today, we bring back the supermodels from the 1920s to think about architecture and urbanism, I think there's a very rich legacy, uh, both in the earth art movement and the broader uh, aesthetic practices that were operating in the in the 60s. This is not an act of reincarnation, though. I mean, some of the mappings that you see are informed by that some of the uh, more contemporary technologies that make them possible. But it's also a, a way of, uh, of maybe uh, shadowing technology as the primary matter, defining matter of these questions, and saying there's a deeper Political and aesthetic contract that uh, um, that uh, um, uh, uh, that supports these practices. So, the technological fixes or technological delusionism or um, that that possibility that this is where the solution resides will no, will not get us to the next step. It's almost one way of displacing the problem to the next uh, to the next. Uh, to the next phase. So we're saying, let's ground it in conversations and in aesthetic practices, and uh, let's try again. Maybe, uh, maybe we need to uh, to knock at the door a few times for change to happen. I have a question for you. So, uh, in looking at the form, this is a good segue because I'm interested in the aesthetics here. I couldn't uh, help but think of the Nudanium debate with Le Corbusier and the shape of the pyramid that happens at the end of the 1920s, and what appears to me to be an inherent kind of classical set of uh, aesthetic references that you guys use, particularly in the cap um, image, where you think about the big pyramid shape and the entrance door next to it. The, that's the one that resonates most with me in this regard. Could you just say a little bit about how you think about classicism in, in terms of the aesthetics here, and whether you thought about the power of the pyramid shape and what what it meant in, in that debate about monumentality that the avant-garde had? Yeah, thank you for, for this question. Um, actually, we, we are very much interested in, uh, in, in setting uh, sort of uh, graphic language that would uh, sort of differentiate our work from what is uh, what is uh, what exists uh, all around us, and so we were interested from the beginning to reject certain types of drawings. Uh, I would say uh, like three-point perspectives, and I would say maybe colorful drawings, and maybe hyper-realistic types of renderings to sort of focus on. Uh, on, on drawings that are maybe black and white and maybe only axonometries and maybe 
know, going back to, to the line as a kind of, uh, of uh, as a primary element of, uh, uh, of, of the project. And uh, so it's the same, it's the same kind of uh, uh, intention for the project. So we, we also wanted to use projects in their kind of uh, maybe most essential and most basic uh, kind of uh, uh, form. And so we, we in, indeed, you know, we, we use sort of, uh, you know, very much interested in some uh, basic forms and, and, and also interested in their power because uh, we, we also feel that, you know, maybe Dutch type of uh, renderings and projects uh, maybe that are you know, sort of using uh, color and hyperrealism and you know forms that are kind of hyper complex sort of made the discussion a little bit more complex and so we, we really believe that going back to the sort of language that is more pure and more simple and forms that also go directly to to the point uh, you know m make a clear clear statement and a clear argument. That's right here, we can't push it, but you can blame also my one for doing a very good job with the history of antiquity. So <laughs> <laughs> Is there any one last question? Okay. Uh, I appreciated your uh, presentation. I'm curious as to why you chose the city of Detroit. So there might be uh, uh, some clarification. So this was uh, this was a project at the University of Michigan, and uh, the first a new initiative actually by the former dean with the explicit uh, mission um, of looking at research on the city. And the site of investigation for that first year was specified as the city of Detroit. So um, that was uh, that was the uh, expected submission for that project. What we did is actually just scale up the conversation in which Detroit features to include that of continental flows. So it's a, it's a uh, let's say it's the client's uh, requirement.